for a few moments from the Romans chapter 6, the 6th chapter of the book of Romans. And I'm going to just read a, a couple of verses and then we'll pray and we'll move right into the word of God. I'll be teaching this morning more than preaching uh, is my plan. We'll see how the Holy Spirit uh, moves this morning. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you this morning for your goodness. We thank you for the moving of your spirit in our hearts and in our lives. We'd ask you, Lord, that you'd bless the offering this morning, those that gave here in the worship room, those across uh, the online experience, God, that you'd bless those lives that are in support of this kingdom. Return it to them, Lord. Open the very windows of heaven and bless their lives and bless their families. And Father, I ask you now that you would use this vessel to speak to your people. Give me clarity of speech and clarity of thought that I might make a certain sound into the ears of your people. Father, I ask it all in Jesus' name. I thank you for it. Amen and amen. When you look at the New Testament experience, you find that the 12 disciples, upon the ascension of Jesus Christ, they were told by the Master, go ye into all nations and teach all tongues, all people, which they did to the very best of their ability. But when you look at the four Gospels, and even at the epistles of the original apostles, you find that they really were eyewitness to the incarnation, the life, the miracles, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. They saw the full spectrum of the time that God was made flesh. Uh, they began to record, and they recorded all the way up to the ascension when he left. And so the thrust of what they taught was basically that we saw with our eyes. We saw him die on the cross. We saw three, three days later that he rose from the dead and we were standing there when he ascended up on high. They taught the cross, that they were eyewitnesses to the fact of Calvary. But it wasn't until about 10 years later, about 44 AD, that Paul was given his commission. And when Paul, who did not walk with Jesus, who was not an eyewitness to, to Jesus' life, when he began to preach, he preached not just the cross, but he preached what the cross meant. What did it mean? So, so, so Jesus came, he died on the cross. That's fine. What does it mean? And if you're a, a member of this ministry and you've been here any number of years, you know full well you have at least had the opportunity to be well taught out of this chapter. But there are many here today that I know perhaps have never been exposed to these truths. And so this morning, in, I want to share with you, in the sixth chapter, Paul is giving us the mechanics of what happened when you were born again. I remember years ago, I was listening, I think I wasn't even saved, but Al Green made a song when he was converted, and, and the lyrics of the song always stuck with me. He was trying to explain what happened. He said, I looked at my hands, and my hands were brand new. I looked at my feet, and they were brand new, too. That was, he was trying to express there was a newness of life that happened when he was born again. But the fact of the matter is your physical body is really not impacted when you're born again. There's not that much impact. On, if you were bald-headed the day before you got saved, you'll be bald-headed the day after you got saved. There's not that much impact. But Paul begins to lay out here the impact of the of Christianity, the born-again experience upon the believer. When he came to chapter 4, or ch uh, the book of Romans, in chapter 4 and 5, he tells us about justification of faith. Justification by faith. That we came into this world, every human being, with a legal status of condemnation. Condemned to hell. That's how we come into this world. Sometimes we don't like to think about that, but I look at my little grandbaby back there, and I realize she has a legal status of condemnation. And as she grows and lives her life, she has to make a decision for Jesus Christ. And when she does so, based on her faith, God gives her a legal decree that your status of condemned has been raised to justified because of your faith that you've expressed in Jesus Christ. 
Now, your salvation is a legal matter. In the courtroom of heaven, it is a legal procedure. Notice the word condemnation is a legal term. The term justification, that is a legal term. Those are both legal statuses. And Paul, in chapter 4 and 5, he began to uh, teach justification by faith, which none of the disciples taught. In fact, Peter said, Paul is preaching things that are hard to be understood. But God gave him, while he was on the Arabian desert, he gave him the revelation of what the cross meant. And he put it within chapter 6 uh, of this important epistle, maybe the most important epistle in the New Testament. But Paul begins by confronting those who challenge the message of grace. Because Paul was teaching that we are no more under law, but we are now under grace. And that we do not operate from a, simple, a rule book of this, do this and don't do that, but rather we operate it under, the, the, under grace and grace alone. And so his distractors were saying, well, Paul, you're just telling the people they can do whatever they want to because uh, the law is fulfilled in Christ and now they're going to go crazy in sin. And so Paul is confronting this head on. And he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, most people, when they read this, they read it and they think they know what it says, but they miss the true meaning that Paul is laying out. When he uses the word sin, he's is not a verb. In this sentence, the word sin is not a verb. He's not saying, shall we continue, just keep on sinning so that grace may abound. That's not the grammatical structure of the sentence. This word is used as a noun. A noun is a person, place, thing, or idea. And so Paul is addressing himself not to the activities of sin, but he's addressing himself to the principle of sin. In other words, he's talking about the sin nature. Now, when you were born, you were born with a sin nature because we are all the sons of Adam. That's that thing inside of you that messes you up. That, that causes you to do what you don't want to do. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? That we say, man, I'm going to do better, and then you do worse. The sin nature on the inside, he sits as a master over the human race. It's why that you got, oh, as you grew from a little innocent child, you grew into deeper and darker sin because you were under the influence and the power of the sin nature. And Paul is asking the question, shall we continue in our relationship with the sin nature because so that grace might abound? He says, God forbid. Away with the thought, let it not be so. But then he begins to go into his theology. He says, how shall we that are dead to sin, again, that word is used as a noun, how shall we that are dead to sin continue any longer therein? Well, that's an interesting thought because how then did we get dead to sin? How is it that I was born with the sin nature as a master over my physical body and now suddenly I get to this first verse of chapter 6 and I'm dead to sin? How did that occur? Well, that's what the born again experience does. This is why religion is not enough. Just coming to church is not enough. There has got to be a time in your life that you can say right there is where it happened. I can take you to the back street on, in Dallas, Texas and tell you right there. That's where he touched me right there. And my whole world changed. That's born again. He says in verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. Now again, many times when we read this, we read it and we think we know what it said, but we're not looking at the, gramma, at the grammar of, of the statement. He begins by saying, know ye not. It means, don't you know? Paul uses this over and over in the book of Romans. Don't you know? Whenever he uses it, there is an expectation that the Christian will know these things because you cannot function correctly in Christianity if you don't know these things. Just like if you don't know what the speed limit is on the street out there, you don't function correctly, you'll go too fast. And so Paul begins by saying, don't you know that so many or as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Now, when we use in our culture the word baptized, we use it exclusively with regard to water baptism. But in the culture of that day, baptize, 
Baptismo, it was a very common word. It was used in everyday language. And the word simply means to immerse. It means to submerge something. It means that like you take a glass and you have a sink of water and you submerge the glass into the water. You've baptized that glass. Now, in the New Testament, there are three different types of baptisms. All of them are not water baptized. There is this of which we speak, and I'll explain it in a moment. It is baptism into Jesus Christ, not in the water, into Christ. The next baptism, number two of the three, is being baptized in the water, something that John the Baptist might do or even the disciples, baptized in the water. And then the third is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so when you're reading the Bible and you see the word baptized, you have to look at the context of the word and understand how it's being used and what it is talking about. Here we're talking about, and it says it very plainly in the third chapter, uh, third verse, uh, that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, not into water, but into Jesus Christ. So here's what happens. When you evidence faith in Jesus Christ, it doesn't have to be mature Christian faith. It doesn't have to be theologically perfect faith. I just said, Jesus, keep me this happy. That's all I said. It was wrong. My whole mindset was wrong. But whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord. When you evidence faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit begins to move immediately. He picks you up. And he walks you over and he submerges you, baptizes you into Jesus Christ. He doesn't baptize you into a church, Christ unveiled. He doesn't baptize you into a religion. He baptizes you into the person of Jesus Christ. In other words, he puts you in union with Christ. It's a work of the Holy Spirit that is triggered by your faith in the finished work of Calvary. Paul says that, don't you know? That so many of us as were baptized, born again that is, into Jesus Christ, were in fact baptized into his death. Now here's what Paul is saying. He's saying that when you evidence faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit picked you up, put you in union, baptized you into Jesus Christ. And in doing so, he put you in union. When Jesus died on the cross, you died with him. You're, you're baptized into his death. You're joined with Jesus Christ. This is what Christianity is. There is nobody that's a Christian that is not in union with Jesus Christ. So he's saying in the next verse, verse 4, Therefore, therefore means based on what I just said, I'm going to give you another principle. Based on the fact that you have been submerged, baptized, put in union with Jesus Christ and in union with his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. He's saying that uh, because of your faith, the Holy Spirit put you in union with him when he died on the cross. And so when he was in buried, you were in union with him as well when he was buried. In the mind of God, he sees you in the body of Christ at the crucifixion. And he sees you in the body of Christ, not the church, in his body when he was buried. So that... Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death so that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, the term even so means just like this, we also should walk in the newness of life. Now, here's the thought. Jesus was crucified. He was buried. He was resurrected. Because we evidence 2,000 years later and Gentiles on top of that, we evidence faith in what he did. The Holy Spirit puts us in union with him on the cross. So when he died on the cross, we died with him. When, when he was buried, when they took him off the cross and he was buried, we were in union with him. We were buried with him. And when he got up out of the grave three days later, we were in union with him and we got up with him. This is why when a person is born again, all of a sudden there's a new power source. There's a new strength that they never had before. The unsaved man or woman live by their personal willpower. That's all they got. And how many know it's not that much? Because we can say, well, I'll never do that again right before we do it again. But when the power of the Holy Spirit is being evidenced in our heart, you don't even say you're not going to do it again. You just walk away like it never happened. 
I smoked two packs of cigarettes every day for, I don't know, almost 12 years. And that day that I met Jesus Christ on that back street, I never smoked another cigarette until this day. I didn't have to try to stop. I didn't have to work at stopping. I didn't have to chew gum and put patches all over me. Praise God, the power of the Holy Ghost, it just went. It just left. It's because there is a new power source. Now, now here's the thought. When Jesus walked in his incarnation, the Bible says the life of the flesh is the blood. Deuteronomy, I believe. So while he walked in the incarnation, his body was the life that gave him animation in his physical body was the blood that flowed in his veins. Well, when he went to the cross, he gave his blood for the sins of the world. So when he got up out of the grave three days later, there was no blood in that body. He had poured out his blood on the mercy seat. So he was being empowered. The same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, the Holy Spirit raised him. The Holy Spirit was the new power source. And now you and I, because we were co-crucified with him, co-buried with him, co-resurrected with him, we now live in the newness of life because our power source is the Holy Spirit. It's only Christians. There, there's no, nobody gets the Holy Spirit other than Christianity. I don't care what they say. I don't care if they say Islam is a better way. No, it's not. Well, well Buddhism is a better way. No, it isn't. Well, if you were a Hindu, you wouldn't. No, no, you won't. The Holy Spirit only moves within the realm of faith evidenced in Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. So that like as Christ, just like Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, just like this, we should walk in the newness of life. Now notice this. He didn't say we would walk in the newness of life. He said we should walk in the newness of life. How many know you can be full of the Holy Ghost and speak in other tongues and you can still fail? Amen. That's the truth. None of us are walking in sinless perfection. Get that lie out of your mouth. That's not happening. You are being challenged every day. Maybe, maybe it's not with drinking and smoking, but it's with the attitude of your heart. It's with anger. It, it's, it's the little foxes that tend to destroy the vine. And so we have to always lean and depend on the Holy Spirit every morning to help us. Every morning I get up, I tell God, Lord, I'm going to need your help today. And I, and I remember back in my mind what, what, what I didn't like. The day before or two days before, whenever that it happened, and I remember, Lord, I don't, want to, I don't want to stumble like that again. And sometimes it's just a look on your face. Sometimes, you know, we learn how not to say it, but we still put it on our face so that we can say it without words. And we have to learn how to bring this whole body into subjection, not through our personal willpower, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. We should. We should walk in the newness of life. It means you have to cooperate with God. It means God is not going to twist your arm and make you saintly. He's not going to twist your arm and make you Christ-like. You, you have to cooperate with him. Verse 5 says, Because, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now verse 5 is explaining verse 4. In verse 4, he said that uh, as God raised him from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life because if we have been planted with him, meaning that if we have been joined with him in his death, when he was the term planted, if we have been planted together in, his, in the likeness of his death, then there's no way that you can, will not be in the likeness of his resurrection. So I said, I can't tell who's a Christian. Well, I can just talk to them five minutes and you'll know. Just watch the attitude five minutes and you'll know. And they may not be a, a, a rank sinner out here getting drunk and running women. You can just tell somebody who does not have the love of God in their heart. You can tell. It doesn't mean they're, they're a bad person. It means they're outside of Christ and they're on their way to hell and they need to repent and come to Jesus Christ. See, repentance is not always, God, I, I repent from smoking dope and drinking liquor and all that. No, God, repentance is this. I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior. <laughs> Every decision I make is wrong. Have you ever tried to make a good decision that just turns out upside down? 
But I find out that when I lean on Jesus Christ and I ask him, Lord, I need help. I don't know what I'm doing. I need you to lead me and guide me. You said you was going to be a teacher for me and a guide and a leader. And I need leadership. And the Holy Spirit always gives me the direction to move in. But this is for those who are in Christ. You ever heard the term in Christ? Paul used three terms in the New Testament, in Christ, through Christ, or by Christ. All of those reflect back to Romans chapter 6. In Christ is in what Jesus did at the cross, death, burial, and resurrection, and our union with him. By Christ is by what Jesus did at the cross, through Christ is through what Jesus did at the cross. It all comes back to these realities. This is the mechanics of your salvation. This is how your salvation is actually, is actually internally built by God to operate in your life. We're co-buried with him. I'm sorry, co-crucified with him, then co-buried with him, and then we're co-resurrected with him. And we have a new power source that helps us live our lives. If it were not for the Holy Spirit, every last one of us, you'd go right back like a dog to the vomit and like a sow to a waddling in the mire, you'd go right back. But it's the power of the Holy Spirit that grips us and holds us in place if we cooperate. Paul would say it this way in the book of Galatians. Everything that he said in those first five verses, he, he summed it up in a summary a statement. For I am crucified with Christ. Meaning that when he died on the cross, I died with him. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Meaning that I've been resurrected. Um, but, but, but yet not I. But now it's Christ living on the inside. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live it by the faith that I expressed in the Son of God. He's given us a synopsis of the theology in Romans chapter 6. He goes on then in verse 6 of chapter 6, he says, knowing this. Now, now catch this, is very important. Most people read right past it. The ending of, of verse 5, he says this. The whole of verse 5. If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this. We shall be in the likeness of his resurrection knowing this. It's going, there's no chapters and books in the original epistle. This was all one sentence. He's saying that we'll be in the likeness of his resurrection as we are knowing this. If you don't know this, it will be difficult for you to fully operate in it. Knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him. Oh, my goodness. You remember that thing you used to be? I'm talking to born-again people. Do you remember, you remember how you used to operate? That old guy, I look back at him before I got saved. I hate that guy. I'm glad he's dead. I wish he would have died earlier. He would have hurt less people. But Paul is saying, knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him. The old depraved sinner that you were when you were brought into union with Jesus Christ at his crucifixion. It was that old man that was crucified. That's why he doesn't wield the power over you that he used to. Because he's, he's crucified and buried with Jesus Christ. And who got up out of that grave was a new man. It was Christ in you. And that's what empowers you to walk in the newness of life. Knowing this, you got to know it. Now, I, I'm moving through this very quickly. We have a Bible study on our webpage in the Bible uh, category, in the Bible study category. It's the full exposition videos of the book of Galatians. I encourage you to go into it. We have a book that we sell. You can see Pastor Taylor. Where I open all of this up, I mean, grammatically, the, the grammar of what is actually said in the scripture this is the core. This is the most important thing you can know. If you're struggling with sin and you know you're born again, you need to understand this. It will help you. You have no ammunition. You don't know many times your legal position. And I'm not trying to talk down to you. I'm saying many people are just not aware that they have a legal standing with God. And based on that legal standing, the whole power of heaven will come to your beck and, and help you in the time of trial. Knowing this, that if our old man is crucified with, I'm sorry, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him so that, so that 
the body of sin might be destroyed. Again, that word sin is not a verb. It is a noun. He's talking about the sin nature. He's saying that the old man was crucified so that this body of sin, the body that was subject to the sin nature, might be destroyed. So that, henceforth, once you know this, once you begin walking in this, so that henceforth you should not serve the sin nature. Now, it doesn't mean you're walking in sinless perfection, but what it does mean is that sin shall not have dominion over you. Do you remember when sin had dominion over you? I tried to stop smoking cigarettes I don't know how many times. Has anybody ever tried to stop without the Holy Ghost? I said, man, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. I was in the Navy, and I, it'd be like, man, I have not smoked a cigarette in two days. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and then you go like 10 days, 11 days, and then, oh, man, I... I smoked a cigarette. Well, I just finished this pack and I'll I stop again. <laughs> well, I want you to know by the power of the Holy Ghost, it's been 35 years. Hallelujah. E effortless. Effortless. He says that the, the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, because he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, the thought here is that, and he explains this more in the first five or six verses of chapter 7. He explains this much more. When you are in a relationship, it's like, it's like a marriage relationship. Uh, me and Sister Lincoln, we, we are married. Our vow said, until death do you part. I made that vow not to her. I made that vow to God, till death do us part. Amen. And, and so nothing can break that relationship except death. And so no doubt later on, I'll be at the house and we'll be, the kids will be over and Sister Lincoln will come and push up on me and kiss me on the cheek because we're in relationship. It's okay. But if over the next week, Sister Lincoln dies or say I die, well, Sister Lincoln shouldn't be kissing on me no more because death has severed that relationship. Are you with me this morning? And that's what Paul is saying here, that your co-crucifixion death with Jesus Christ has severed the relationship between you and the sin nature so that you should not, you should not continue in sin. It doesn't mean sinless perfection, but it means you'll be a whole lot better. It means that you won't be under the, the jackbooted heel of the sin nature and doing things that you don't want to do. Verse 10, he says, I've got a rush. I'm sorry, verse uh, 8. For he says, for if, notice the word if, because it's all contingent on if you've been baptized into his death. If we be dead with Christ, based on baptism with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him, knowing that, here again, you need to know something, knowing that, Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. <laughs> One day I'm going to take off this fleshly body, but I'll never die. He that believeth in me shall never die. What is getting more raggedy day after day after day? I have to maintain it more and more and more. Every year of my life, I have to work more and more to just to keep it functional. But one day, I'm going to take it off altogether. And God's got a brand new body for me that's incorruptible. Praise God, it's immortal and that it will never die. Do you believe this? He says that Christ being from, raised from the dead uh, dieth no more. In other words, there's no second death. I've already died. <laughs> so I said, you're getting old. You're going to die. No, I'm not either. I'm going to live forever. Jesus said, if you believe on me, you have eternal life. Eternal life doesn't mean you die and then you start living again. It means you never stop. You just take off this raggedy body. No more cavities. No more gray hair. Come on, no more bulge in the belly. Got to do 100 sit-ups a week to keep your belly from bulging out. It'd be no more like when you was 18. You had abs. You wasn't even trying. They were just there. Praise God. Hallelujah. Verse 10 says, for in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, just like that. 
reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. Now this word reckon, it requires a mental process. It means you have to evaluate the information and you have to reconcile the facts and you have to come to the biblical conclusion that you are dead to sin. It's like we have an accountant. Every month I send her our books and she pulls out bank statements and she reconciles all the accounts and she takes all the numbers from the bank and all the numbers on our side and they have to reconcile to the right answer. Well, you and I, we have to look at the facts that Paul has given us in the Bible. We have to reconcile them and come to the biblical conclusion that I am dead to the sin nature. It no longer rules under, over me. Before, I didn't have a choice. Man, I was dying on that dope. It was killing me. But I didn't have a choice. I couldn't stop. I was under the influence of the sin nature. Oh, praise God, but now I've got a choice. I choose to live. I choose to serve God. I choose to be an example of Christianity. That's my choice. And you have a choice. And even if you mess up, my God, get up. That's what the blood is for. Come on, if you fall short, that's why he shed his blood for the remission of sin. You reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but at the same time alive unto God. Here it is, through Jesus Christ, through what Jesus did at the cross. Because of what he did at the cross, I'm dead to the sin nature, but I'm alive to God. Hallelujah. I have, I, I'm every day, I'm in communion with God. I talk to him. He talks back to me. Hallelujah. He leads me. He guides me. He gives me instruction. He gives me rebuke sometimes. I need all of those things. I'm in communion with him. He's my father. Hallelujah. Alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Finally, verse 12. I'm going to ask the musicians please to come back. Based on everything that he's taught us. He now says, let not sin. Again, the word sin there is a noun. He's talking about the sin nature, not just the activities of sin. And here quickly is the thought. If you keep looking at the activities of sin, it's like trying to pluck the leaves off of a tree. It's too many of them. But John the Baptist said, now herein is the ax laid at the root of the tree. And so Jesus came to deal with the sin nature itself. And when you, when you take that trunk down, all the leaves come down at the same time. Let not. You have something to do with this. You have a part to play in this. You have the choice to either let or to let not. And if you are in a struggle, you have the option to call upon the power of the Holy Spirit. Come boldly to the throne of grace and cry out for help and mercy in the time of need. That's what he said. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. These are the mechanics of salvation. This is how your salvation was put together. I've, I've thrown out a lot of material this morning. I realize that usually it would be, I'd go several hours to go through this. On our website, go to the Bible study or archive. We have the full book of Romans. Go through it. We have a book that we wrote several years ago on chapter 6, 7, and 8 uh, of the, the book of Romans. Uh, you can see Pastor Taylor. He can put that into your hands. This sermon will be back on the webpage uh, Monday, midday Monday. This will be on the webpage. Get this in your spirit. Don't you know? You need to be able to say, yes, I do. I know. Amen. Would you bow your heads, please, all over the room this morning? Father, what a wonderful salvation you've afforded us. The redemption plan of God, Lord, is marvelous in our eyes. And, oh God, help us today to, to, to receive this gospel, to have an interest in it, to go further into it. Lord, that we might know the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of this great love that you've showed us. Lord, that you justified sinners and you did so maintaining your perfect holiness. Father, we just thank you this morning. Come on, would you stand to your feet if you're able this morning all over the room? And let's just give God thanks for what he did. This entire redemption plan, you and I have to pay for none of it. All of it is paid for by Jesus Christ. All we have to do is merely believe. Just tell him thank you this morning. Father, we thank you for so great a salvation that you've wrought through Christ. 
When you raised him from the dead, Lord, you raised the entire Gentile church at the same time. We thank you this morning. You've had such great mercy, such great kindness upon us. You've shown us such great love. Father, we just tell you thank you this morning. Come on, tell him thank you, won't you? Won't you just tell him thank you this morning? Thank you, Father, Lord. we just thank you right now for the grace and mercy that you've bestowed upon us. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be able in the, to be in the likeness of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We thank you this morning for allowing us to be in Jesus, to place our faith in what he did on Calvary. And God, we just thank you and we praise you for your word this morning. In your holy name, amen. You know, it's just good to know this. It's important to know this because it's by knowing this, we can recognize the price that was paid. We can see his salvation, his justification, his reconciliation of man back to him. But we have to know this. We thank God for all of you being here with us today. Those of you who are tuned in by the webcast, we appreciate you being with us. And as you depart, I just want to remind you all, if you're interested in volunteering for first worship, you don't have to see me. There's a sign-up sheet out there. We're looking for servers, and we're looking for those who want to assist in the cleanup, and we appreciate it. There will be no prayer this week, no Bible class, and we will come in at 11 p.m. on New Year's Eve and bring in the new year, praising and worshiping God. But let me say, don't come in late. You want to get here early. Praise God. Is that all right? Amen. What I say unto one, I say unto all, watch, pray, know what Jesus did every day. Amen. Thank you for watching and please subscribe. You can also find more of our videos in our archives at ChristUnveiled.org. We'll see you next time.